Hello everyone. Today we are going to be running post hoc tests in R. So, you know what? I'm going to get out of here. Let's start from the beginning. Yeah. So first, you're going to want to be sure that you go up to session and set your working directory. Use directory. Mm -hmm. I'm using my biostats folder. And then you want to open your post hoc testing code. We're coming here to the opening folder. I have mine. All right. We're going to be using the microhabitat data set as well as the rats data set, just like we did for analysis of variants. But for now, I'm just going to upload the microhabitat data set. I do expect you to do everything we're about to do. Um, well, not everything. I expect you to run the appropriate post hoc test on the rats data set. I'm going to show you all of the examples with this microhabitat data set, but then when we finish with that, I want you to go, I want you to determine which post hoc testing procedure you think is most appropriate for this data set, the rats data set, and complete post hoc testing for that data set. But for now, let's just run through the various kinds of post hoc testing that we talked about in the last lecture. So We'll look at the data. This is a data set you're already familiar with, but just to remind you, our dependent variable, I, I know you ran ANOVAs, uh, one on, velo both of them on velocity. One was based on site, so middle, upper, and lower parts of a river, and then you yourself, I had you um, d determine if there was a difference among different habitats in a river with respect to velocity. Okay, so, whew, sorry, I'm a little tired. Okay, so let's come back here. First, you're going to want to install the LawStat package. The LawStat package is actually for Levine's test of homogeneity of variances that I'm going to show you at the bottom of this. It's not for any of these pairwise comparisons or for two of these tests, but I want you to have this. So if you're going to use Levine's test, which I will teach you about in just a moment, then you will need the LawStat package. So let's install it. All right, so now let's add it to our library. You got to be sure you do that. Otherwise, functions won't work. This package was built under our version 3.5.3. .3. Nobody cares. Okay, so remember we talked about three post hoc testing procedures. And first, let's just go ahead and talk about unplanned comparisons first, if you don't mind. So the first is Bonferroni corrected pairwise t-tests. This is where you have a specific number of pairwise comparisons you're, you are making, but they weren't planned a priori. First thing you're going to need to do is determine your new alpha. Remember, to determine your new alpha, you're going to divide your original alpha by C, which is the number of pairwise comparisons you're making. So I also want to point out and just remind you that the Bonferroni corrected test, the Bonferroni correction procedure, makes this test more conservative but less powerful. So reduces the, the likelihood of type 1 error, but slightly increases the likelihood of type 2 error where you're not detecting a true effect. A lot of folks actually, there's quite a bit of, uh, I wouldn't call it argument, debate in the statistics community because there are other procedures for uh, correcting p-values and alpha values to make tests uh, less likely to have that type higher type 1 error rate, to reduce experiment-wise error rates, but Bonferroni is the most well-known, the most accepted, and definitely for an introductory stats class is the one you would use. I very rarely see anybody except for like super pure math stats people use anything but Bonferroni. So you don't have to worry about home procedure or anything, just Bonferroni. You probably, oh, I shouldn't have even said it. Sorry, sometimes I, like I know too much and then I'm telling you too much and then you get confused. So let's just Bonferroni correct some stuff, okay? Yeah. All right. So first, again, 
we're going to take our original significance level was 0.05. And remember, what we were doing, we're going to use the same example I used before with the ANOVA. So we're comparing velocity among upper, middle, and lower sides of a river. So if you think about that, you're, you're crossing upper by middle, upper by lower, that's two, and then middle by lower. So you're going to potentially have three tests. So if you're going to just adjust that, you've got 0.05 divided by three. So 0.0, I would actually 0.017 or 0 0.0167. It's going to be your new significance level. Okay, so do you see how that's more conservative? Because your p-value has to be lower to be significant. All right, so now you can just run the pairwise t-test. It's that simple. You will need this particular function. So this isn't the same as just a t-test. Pairwise t-test crosses the possible crosses, all the possible crosses. Okay, so pairwise t-test. All right, and here I'm saying, hey, R, I want you to run a pairwise t-test. I want you to do it with this is my y, my dependent variable. So in the microhabitat data set, velocity is our dependent variable by the independent variable. But notice the comma here. Yes. Okay. Not a tilde. It's a comma. It matters. All right. And then here you have p adjust Bonferroni. Now, in this procedure, the way I'm teaching you this today this isn't going to do a ton, but here's the thing. I'm not making you, and I have the, this note here below, I'm not making you adjust p-values. I'm having you adjust the alpha because that's way easier for you all right now. Um, so there is a, a, a p-adjust function where it actually gives you the adjusted p-values and then you compare it to your original alpha but it gets kind of convoluted a lot of the times in people's minds. It ends up confusing people. So you're welcome to look that up and use it, but to keep things really simple, we're just gonna adjust our alphas with our handy dandy calculators. Boop, boop, alpha divided by the number of tests, and then run our pairwise t-tests. Sound good? Okay, so let's run this. Check it. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Let's just make this a little bigger. I don't like seeing all that red, but whatever. It's not actual warning, or not actual um, errors. So, pairwise comparisons using t-tests. All right, so check it. Middle versus lower. Middle, uh, I mean, duh. Upper versus lower, and upper versus middle. Okay, so let us once again check our... Oh, okay, a rut row raggy. It appears that only the upper portion of the river is different from the lower. The middle and the lower portion of the river do not satisfy this new adjusted significance level. And the upper and middle portions wouldn't have even with the original significance value, the original alpha. Okay, so that's how you would do that. Now, let me make it very clear. I'm about to show you other ways to run post hoc tests on the same data set. You would not run them all on the same data set. You would choose the most appropriate one and just run that one. Okay? So, I told you, pairwise t tests are the most conservative. You really, and here's the thing with unplanned comparisons, so um, pairwise t tests that are Bonferroni corrected are Tukey's honestly significant difference tests. That's what HSD stands for. Both of them, for unplanned comparisons, both of them have pros and cons. Just remember, the pairwise t-tests, Bonferroni corrected, are more conservative, two keys, more powerful, okay? But still controls experiment-wise error rate. So most of the time, people will run two keys tests. But if you, you know, if you just want to uh, run pairwise t-tests and you can justify it, say, hey, you know, I prefer to be more conservative, even though I'm losing some power. That's okay. And you might be like, well, what? So how do I really know what to run? Well, I can tell you for my part, unless somebody told me to run a Bonferroni corrected pairwise t-test when I was a new statistician, I usually ran a Tukey's, unless I was told otherwise. But that's just because it's, it's very powerful but still controlling that experiment-wise error rate. However, it's very important for you to understand this.
because this is another thing that you see all the time in the literature. Some folks really prefer to be very conservative with their statistics, which I, I can respect that. Okay, so, so we've done this first procedure that you could use for unplanned comparisons. So let's go through Tukey's Honestly Significant Difference Test, or the Tukey-Kramer method, Tukey's test. All right, note here, I'm putting in my novel model, and I'm calling it something different than I did before. In the last code, I think I called it model. So velocity by sight. So you have to have an ANOVA model. Oh, I didn't name that right. An ANOVA model to get your Tukey test results. Okay, that's important. I mean, why would you run a Tukey test if you hadn't run an ANOVA? Exactly. I know. Okay, so velocity by sight. I'm just calling it that. You could call it whatever you want. Name it something cute. Make me laugh. I'm stuck here in quarantine. Uh, so we're running an ANOVA just to review, on the microhabitat data set. And here is our dependent variable, and then I'm comparing across my levels of my independent variable. Cool, so let's run that, because you have to have it ran. You gotta have it. Okay, so let's just review quickly for funsies. Get your ANOVA table out. Sun's out, ANOVA table's out. Oh, Ooh, baby, Ooh, look at that. Okay, sorry. So, clearly I put the wrong thing there. That's cute. So we gotta make sure it's the same name as our ANOVA model. That was the original model name. So sue me. Alright, so here, that's the function. Tukey HSD. And here, here's the thing. Tukey will always try to help you out a little bit. Okay, so just put in the model name. You could, well, I don't want to confuse you. Just put in the model name. Okay, so once again, it just looks a little different from the pairwise t-test. This is middle versus lower, upper versus lower, upper versus middle. These are differences between means lower bounds and upper bounds. You don't have to really worry that much about this stuff. Oh my gosh, guys, please listen to these words. Oh man, I just had like a flashback. For the love of Pete, don't report these numbers. The diff, lower and the upper. Please, don't report the difference lower and upper bounds. Please don't do that. Um, last year, everybody was, like, giving me all the numbers. I'm like, man, all you care about needs to be the p-value. Just, just the p-values. Show me the p-values. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to correct anything here. Tukey's test adjusts stuff within the test. You don't have to do anything, and you can use your original alpha, which is another reason a lot of people just like to use Tukey's test, because it's very straightforward. So, a key. Whoa, do you see this? All right. So this is also interesting, and I love, this is why I like this example. So, upper versus lower, as before, with our Bonferroni adjusted um, pairwise t-test, again, same as before. Upper and lower are very different. However, here you see, here you see the difference between the Bonferroni corrected um, P pairwise t-test and the Tukey's test. Before, the middle and lower parts of the river did not differ. You see now that pairwise t-test was ultra conservative, and so we lost some power, and so we didn't detect an effect that was detected by the Tukey's test. This is another reason why Tukey's is so popular. So, you do have a difference here, but still, of course, no difference between upper and middle. Okay. So in this procedure, you would you would say, okay, and you don't have to copy and paste them, I just say like middle versus lower parts of the river, like use actual English, you know. Um, you would just tell me, basically, you know, the middle and lower parts of the river were, you know, differed, and tell me which one was larger, the higher velocity. Um, and when you would create a graph, right, then you would have, you know, perhaps you'd have your upper on the left side. That would be like your, you'd have a column there, and then your middle would be in the middle, and then, oh, I should do that. And then your lower, right? And so your upper would be A, middle would be 
actually still A because they're not different, right? But middle and lower are different. So it would be, let's see, A, A, B. Because middle and upper are different from lower. So it would be A, A, B. I had to think about it. All right. So let's, those were the two unplanned contrasts. Now, if you were a priori, come up with planned contrasts. First, you have to code them and be sure they are orthogonal. This is assuming that you have done that. I am putting up data sets that will be up before noon on Thursday so that you can practice this. You have, and they're not for points or anything. You just can do them for funsies. Um, it's not going to be a ton, but just to give you some practice with coding orthogonal comparisons. And you might say, well, what is, or, what is orthogonality? Well, orthogonality is actually, I mean, in math, it's like an angle. But here in statistics, it has to do with, literally, I've told you one of those rules was, you know, the sum of the products of the coefficients must be zero. That is orthogonality in statistics. Okay, that's, that's what it is, those rules. Okay. So, if your planned contrasts are orthogonal, bruh, all you gotta do is run t-tests. That's all you gotta do. That's amazing. Okay, so here, I am going to subset my data to run those t-tests. So let me explain what we're doing. This is where I'm just going to be comparing the upper versus the middle. I'm naming it that, just so I don't get confused. And I'm saying, hey, R, I want you to subset the microhabitat data set and I want you to take out anything in the column site named lower. And it's like it's saying site exclamation point equals this does not equal. Site does not equal lower. Okay? You're taking out the lower sites. So watch what happens. My environment's going to populate over here. Let's look at it. Noise. Noise. No, no lowers. Do you see that? So if you need to subset data, that subset function is, it just is the best. It comes in clutch. Did I use that word right? I don't know. I was born in the 90s. Okay. So, whatever your deep independent variable column name is, that's what would go here. And exclamation point equals means does not equal. Okay. Okay. So let's run the t-test. And here, I think the data were heteroscedastic. If memory serves, uh, the header data were heteroscedastic. So I'm using a Welch's t-test. Aha! So here you have your p-value and your t-statistic. So upper versus middle are not... Whoa! Wow, they are different. How about that? So according to the planned contrast, here's the thing. You may be like, what? What's going on? Um, so it really just depends on how you designed your study. And if you plan these planned contrasts like that, this is what your result would be. <laughs> okay. It all has to do with how you design your experiment. Let's actually, just for funsies. Oh my gosh, this one got me blue up. Let's just look at that if it was a sample, shall we? Ah, okay. okay. That is a plain old t-test, right? That, and, the, and the reason it's different like that is because you're not doing any kind of pairwise t-test. Um, you're not doing all possible comparisons. And so the p-values, p-values are adjusted for that, okay? So that's why it's like that. I mean, I was surprised simply because I haven't looked at these data in a little while. Um, but... That's, that's something that can happen because you're not testing all possible comparisons. You're doing individual t-tests, which you can do because you planned them that way. Okay, that's why experimental design is so important. However, you know, truth be... Okay, did y'all hear that weird noise? That was literally my dog. That was... She does that. Okay. Ziggy, I'm sorry. I have to do this. She's like, please stop talking so I can... Okay. So let's do upper versus lower. Again, we're subsetting in the microhabitat data set. Let me just see how long this has been because I hate making you guys wait for too long. Okay, good. So site does not, we're taking out the middle, okay? Whoa, there it is. Okay, so always check that though because man, 
you you wouldn't believe how many times me and all my friends <laughs> thought we subset stuff, but then we did it. Okay, so let's run the t test. Upper versus lower. Of course, and once again, see a very low p value. And then of course you'd want to you'd want to report that t statistic here. Um, you may notice your pairwise t tests only give you p values. Two keys didn't give you a Q statistic here in R. They only gave you p-values. That's okay. Just report those p-values. All right? But if you get a T statistic, it's nice to report it. Okay. Now, let's do upper versus... Nope, we just did that. Middle versus lower. All right? Again, we're going to subset the data set and take out... Subset, subset in the microhabitat data set... And within the site column, that's our treatment column, we want everything that does not equal upper. We're taking out upper. Okay, and we're going to check that on not. We're going to check it. Ooh. Okay, good. And we'll run that t-test. There we are. Oh, wow. So when you, when you plan orthogonal comp contrast, it all turn out to be different. Okay. Now, let's run post hoc testing on the RAT CSV data set. You tell me, what post hoc test should you use? You can't really be wrong. If, well, you can be, but it's hard to be wrong when you do unplanned contrast, as long as you can justify it. And by justify it, I mean, you just tell me why you ran it that way. Why you prefer that, okay? So you're going to paste that code below as needed. Now, if you do this before Thursday morning, which is unlikely because it's now Wednesday night. I'm sorry, I was in the field all day. Um, but if you did do it before Thursday morning, you could go ahead and do this. And if you had any errors, we could talk about it. However, if you don't get the chance to, that's totally fine. Um, in fact, maybe I'll... Ex this isn't going to be due until the following Thursday anyway. So you have plenty of time. This is going to be due the same week as your test because it's not fair really to expect you to turn in homework and a class exercise from earlier in the week and then another one. That's too much. So just know you have a week. So you can ask about this tomorrow or you can ask about it next Thursday. But down here is where you should post that code. Okay. So if you don't in this, in these examples, you don't have to post where you test your assumptions. You will re need to run the ANOVA model, um, but that's just to do your post hoc testing. So just be aware of that. All right, now I'm going to give you a few other notes. And I'm going to read here um, and explain. There are a few statistical tests to check assumptions. There are actually, there is a statistical test, there are actually a couple to test for normality. Um, and for homogeneity of variances. I'm introducing these now and not before because here, well, here's why. People, when people are given these tests, I can promise you they become a crutch um, if it's the first thing they learn. So I wanted you to learn to first visually inspect your data to test your assumptions and learn to rely on your your knowledge of what homogeneity variances should look like and, and normality should look like rather than relying on a p-value cutoff because I have I know folks who have been basically just they're not um they're not it's not it's, it's a crutch it's basically a crutch so it's better to just use this to verify your hunches about your assumptions that's that's the best thing so I don't even run these anymore. But when I was first starting out, I would uh, use my my graphs and look at my histogram and look at my box plots and my normal QQ plot. I'm going to throw this computer across the room. Oh my gosh, you guys. Okay. Um, so I would, oh no, not the blue. Okay, whatever, man. We're going to keep rolling with it because we got to get through this so, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, you would check your assumptions with your graphs, right? Box plots, normal QQ plots, histograms, 
check for those outliers. But then, if you're like, mm, is it normal though? Or if you just want to kind of double check yourself or just to see, you can run these tests. Okay, but please don't let them become a crutch. All right. You will continue and you should continue to check your assumptions visually. You have to turn them in that way. It, but do feel free. You can provide me with the outputs from your Shapiro Wilk tests and Levine's tests if you want. But I want to make it clear these are optional. The visual and graphical inspection of assumptions is not optional. These are optional. Okay. But some people feel really comfortable. They're like, or if they're not sure, if it's there, if they're like, this looks sort of normal, but I'm not completely sure. And I look at my box plot and that doesn't help me. And my normal QQ plot is not a straight, perfect straight line, but it's close. Then you might run a Shapiro Wilk test. I do that if I'm just like bum, just bum fuzzled. So, all right. Shapiro Wilk test for normality. So if you see this, and so very occasionally you'll see these in papers. They'll say, we ran a Shapiro Wilk test to test for normality. And usually I roll my eyes and go, if that's all you use, then you suck at stats. But that's okay. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting a little get a little attitude late at the evening. So this is important to remember. The null hypothesis for this test is that your data are, are that's their data are plural, not significantly different from a normal distribution. Okay? The null is that they're not different from normal. So the null is that they are normal. So high p values where you you fail to reject the null means your data are normal. Low p-values means your data differ from normal. All right? And you're going to do this with your dependent variable, just like you do with a histogram. Duh. You know this, man. Okay, so let's go down here. Boop, 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 boop. All right, here it is. And I'm saying, hey, R, let's run a Shapiro test. You want to do it? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. You can name the Shapiro test if you want. You can say, my first, my first Shapiro and it's actually the Shapiro Wilk. I'm going to call it Shapiro Wilk. There we go. You can name it that. That'd be cool. You don't have to. And then in the microhabitat data set, the velocity column, because that's my dependent variable. So let's run it. Oh, run it so cute. Okay. Now, if you just ran this without naming it, it would just show you the results. But since I named it, just to show you. What's handy about that, though, is you can always just call this up by using the name. And here you have it. So this is the actual, it's a test, the, the W statistic. You don't ever have to report this. It's just the p-value. It wouldn't in doubt, just make sure you report the p-value. And you're probably going to be okay. So this is a very, and remember, that makes sense. Very not normal. Remember, this is really highly skewed towards zero to low velocity values. And that makes sense because it was a weightable stream. Okay, that's an important thing to always think about. Why do I see these trends in my data? Well, there are trends in nature that you're seeing. If you're in a part, if this is part of an ecological test, if it's part of a medical study, you're seeing trends in human physiology or whatever the, the variable is that you're studying, right? So you need to always bring it back to the biological effects. Okay, so that's that test for normality, just for funsies. Levine's test for homogeneity of variances. Okay, the null hypothesis is that the variances do not differ, and so they are equal. So homoscedasticity is the null. So when you fail to reject the null, it's just the same with this with Shapiro Wilk. When you fail to reject the null, that means your data are homoscedastic. Okay. Low p values mean your data are heteroscedastic and may require some transformation or non-parametric analyses, such as a Kruskal Wallace. Okay. So here I'm saying, what's up, Laura? Let's run a Levine test. That's fun. Okay, now, you've got to use your dependent and independent variable just as you would when creating a box plot. So I'm saying I'm running a living test on, in the microhabitat data set, my dependent variable goes here. Dependent, y always goes first in R. Y by x. So velocity, camera. In the microhabitat data set, the treatment, okay? You can do the location around the median, and that's what your box plots are actually usually showing, okay? All right. Do it. Dang. Okay. So here, the variances are fairly equal. And I, I seem to recall having some good box plots there. 
Okay, so that's all I'm going to show you with these data sets today. Do make sure that you run on the REST data set sometime this week. Definitely do it before you take your test. I know it's not completely optimal that I'm having it do the we same week as your test, but that was because my thought was I wanted to give you more time. I didn't want to give you too much stuff that's due all at once. And this is good practice for your tests because you're literally going to do this on your test. Okay. Now, since we've talked a little bit about non-parametric t-tests, because you had some really crazy t-test data, I don't expect you to run non-parametric t-tests, because I've taught you three kinds of t-tests already, and I'm trying not to overload you as beginning statisticians. However, if you see these names, or you're interested in running these tests, I wanted to provide them for you as um, just a service. If you come across crazy data on your test and you decide you want to use one of these, that's fine. However, remember, you can be creative in statistics. As long as you can justify what you did well and it makes sense with the data you have, then you can't, you're not wrong. Okay? As long as you know what you're doing. That's the big thing. You have a lot of leeway if it's clear that you know what you're doing. Okay? And if you don't know what you're doing, we should talk. Okay, so here is the code for a non-parametric independent sample, two sample, t-test. It's called a Mann-Whitney u-test. And I'm, not, I'm just giving you, this is just template code, um, just so you have it. So all of these use uh, the, the function Wilcox.test instead of t.test. So just be aware of that. And so here you have in the data set name, you put your dependent variable with a tilde buyer independent variable. That's it. That's a man we need to test. Oh, wow. All right. This is if they are, now to clarify, this is if the independent variable is on one column and the dependent variable is all on one column. But remember, sometimes you might have data where one treatment is one column and another treatment is another. In that case, same kind of thing, you just use the comma, just as you would with the student's t-test, the parametric version. <coughs> oh no, is that you, oh no? Okay, now, if you want to run a non-parametric pair t-test, okay, then here, and this is assuming they're in different columns, okay, but you can change it to a y by x situation if you need to. The difference here, notice it's still wilcox.test, but you're going to put in the paired paired equals true stipulation. This makes it, this changes it from a Mann-Whitney U test, which is a non-parametric independent sample T test, where you have that independence assumption, to a Wilcoxon test. And there are a couple kinds of Wilcoxon tests, but just know a Wilcoxon test is a paired non-parametric test, a uh, non-parametric paired T test. Okay. Now again, I'm just showing you these today, just so you have them. They're not, I'm not gonna test you over this. I'm gonna, I will test you over parametric t-tests. But I just want you to have this at your disposal should you ever need it, especially since it came up. Okay, that's all there is to this. So make sure that you do your RATS data set, run that ANOVA model, and then come up with the appropriate post-talk testing. Paste your outputs into your Word document and very clearly outline what your overall um, conclusions would be. All right. And then I'm not going to make you do graphs, but just know, be sure you understand how you would, how you would cod codify, you know, where you have differences, A versus B versus C, for example, if you had three groups that were all different. Okay. Just make sure you understand that. All right, so uh, be sure to let me know if you have any questions. You can always post them in the discussion board or email them to me, and I'll always talk about them the following Thursday during your 8 a.m. optional extra credit Q&A. Okay, take care. Be sure to save your code. I always say, oh, my gosh, save the code. And I will see you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Miss you guys. Bye.